You guys ready for some word? If you are, uh, get your Bible or your Bible app or your social media out or what? <laughs> I know one guy who used to come in here and he would take notes from the message on his social media app. So I guess you can do that if you want. And uh, let's go to Genesis chapter 5. Genesis chapter 5. I started a new message a few weeks ago called How to Walk with God. And if you are new with us today, you would benefit from hearing what went before because this builds upon that. Uh, nevertheless, I think there are standalone principles that will help you just today as well. Uh, we want to read in Genesis chapter 5 and verse 21 to begin. It, it reads, Enoch lived 65 years and begot Methuselah. After he begot Methuselah, e Enoch walked with God 300 years. Is it possible to be faithful to God that year, that long? Yes. To walk with God uh, for, you know, your whole life? Maybe we're not living 300 years on earth, but uh, could, you, could you walk with God for 80 years? And continue and not backslide in the middle? <laughs> A lot of silence there. I'm not asking you if you did. If you did, there is mercy and redemption to be restored. I'm just saying, can you? Is it possible to be faithful and walk with God all your life? Would that be better? I mean, since the scriptures say the way of the transgressor is hard, <laughs> we might want to consider it. <laughs> not taking a year off. Not, you know, going the way of the world for a few years and then coming back. Those of you who have done that, gone, you know, got saved and then you, you were tempted, whatever went back in the world. Don't you wish you wouldn't have? I mean, everyone says that. <laughs> and so Enoch walked with God 300 years and had sons and daughters. And so all the days of Enoch were 365 years. And Enoch walked with God and he was not, for God took him. Now, Enoch being not, uh, that just means that he disappeared, that he left this earth without dying. For God. He got so close to God that he was just out of here. He just stepped over into eternity, into the spirit, however you want to say that. And uh, that's glorious. If Enoch could do that, you think you could? Now, I'm not saying you can do the latter part as far as just disappearing. You might be able to. That's between you and the Lord. I'm not saying I have a, a formula for that, but I'm saying, could we all walk with God and have him be that real to us? Yeah. Yeah. If Enoch could, we can, because Enoch was, was uh, before the cross. So spiritually he was dead. He was not born again. We have an advantage over Enoch. And yet he pulled this off for 300 years and was so tight with the Lord. Man, what an impressive life. Yeah. Now, now let's look at Hebrews then. That's the other side of the book. And uh, Hebrews has a few things, very little, but very powerful to say about Enoch as well. Most of the Bible is Enochless, <laughs> but the parts that are Enochful are very powerful. In Hebrews chapter 11, Notice the fifth verse with me. It reads, By faith Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death. So Enoch was taken away. In, in Genesis, it doesn't mention the faith part. But New Testament revelation is going to be more light. So the commentary on what happened is he walked with God and was taken by faith. All right, that's key. It's key for us to understand. Because if we ever hear of somebody else's experience and you think, well, they had an advantage. God, God, you know, showed himself to them in a vision or they, you know, had these extra experiences. I don't know what Enoch had. All I know was his walk with God and his departure was a faith act. And if it's faith, it's not sight. Faith believes what you're told and then acts upon it. Sight is looking for something physical to confirm or to uh, reveal to you. That's not what he had. Everybody with me? Yeah. Yep. Say, if Enoch could do it. Enoch can do it. Maybe I said that too fast. If Enoch could do it, I can do it. I can do it. 
I can walk by faith with God. Yes. Amen. For God had, where did we re- leave off? For God took him and was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. All right? And so uh, how did he please God? Of course, he did so by faith. You read the next verse, and it tells us that this is a, a required belief. In fact, there are two required beliefs to get close to God. Absolutely, you have to do this. no way around it. You must, number one, believe that he is. And number two, you must believe that he is a rewarder. You must believe that he rewards. If we don't believe those two things, we can't come to him. Okay, watch. What if I believe that he is and he is a punisher of those who diligently seek him? <laughs> I can't come to him. Okay. Pastor Bill, could, you, could I borrow you real quick? If, if, if he's the Lord and, uh, and I want to come to him, I cannot believe that when I get to him, he's going to knock me in the head. Right? If I believe that, I can't come to him. I, might want, I don't want to come to him. Right? I can't believe that if I come to him, he's going to turn his back on me. Or, watch, that he's going to ignore me. If I believe, thanks, I think that'll do it. (laughs) Uh, If I believe that about God, either that he's going to respond to me in the negative, or he's going to blow me off, I can't come to him. We won't make a connection. We won't have a relationship. That's why it's required belief. I must believe. I have to believe this. Say, well, I don't believe that. Then you won't come to him. Okay? We don't have to argue about it. You just won't come to him. If you're going to come to him, though, and if you want him, and he's wantable, he's desirable, he's a good God. If you want to be with him, you have to believe that he is. And you have to believe that when you get to him, he's going to give you good things. Just the fact that you would seek him diligently, he is going to reward you for that. Yeah, but those beliefs in place, you get God. You get that divine connection. You get that experience that the average Joe has no clue about. The average person in this world, they, they, they don't even know that can happen. But their beliefs about God are, are funky, are twisted. They don't know how good he is. And it's sometimes religion's fault that their beliefs are wrong. They've been told, they've been taught from childhood that God is a certain way and he's the other way. Amen. Amen. Now back to this. Um, Connection to God is what I call our default setting. It is the most natural, normal. um, It's the way we are automatically. If If you're a believer, God has connected you to himself and that's, that's easy. Connecting, communing, talking with, experiencing God is easy. Everybody say it out loud. Say it, it is, is, easy. is easy. Yeah. And I'll get back to you and tell, and tell you more about why that's the case. But uh, uh, we, were, we were created to walk with God, not just to do things for God. We were not uh, designed to be slaves. He wasn't seeking slaves, but rather family and friends. All right. And if you think about God from that perspective, he wants to be with us, not just have us work for him, not just have us do things that he likes. Jesus uh, exhibited this when he called the 12 to be with him. In fact, the scripture says over there in Mark chapter 3 and verse 14 that then he appointed 12 that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach. Did you notice the order? Yeah. Mm-hmm. He appointed 12 that they might work for him, preach for him, serve him. No, that they would just be with him. 
And I want you to know that's still the heart of God. It's still his desire for you, for me, not just that we act a certain way, but we just be with him. He likes you. <laughs> he likes me. What does he want from me? He wants to be with you. Now, I'm not saying that he doesn't have a plan, a purpose, a, an assignment for your life. He does. You play a significant role in his eternal plan. I'm just saying that can't be first. And that can't be the full reason why we seek him. Uh, the being with him must be first. Or we're likely just to become religious, maybe judgmental, and even burned out. All right? If ever someone gets to that place where they're, a little, you know, they're, they're saved, they have, they received salvation, but they're kind of mean. <laughs> they're kind of judgmental. They're, they're uh, uh, even just always tired and burned out and not really very excited about the Lord or about his plan. It's, it's likely that their personal connection of just being with God is deficient. Amen. One of the things I've noticed over many years when talking with uh, people who are struggling in some area of their life, uh, that many times, I think it's the Lord who helps me to ask this question, but now you know my secret. <laughs> How's your walk with God? How's your relationship with God? How's that going? And almost always, the answer is, well, you know, not so good, or it could be better, or... You know, I haven't been praying. I don't spend time in the word. I'm just, and it's not like they're horrible people. A lot of times they're working in the ministry, serving in the church, but feeling like their candles burning at both ends and they're, they're lacking strength and vitality and, and they're wanting an answer, but the answer is not complex. The answer is, how's your walk with God? Not what are you doing for God? Not are you faithful to give your tithe? Not are you faithful to go to church. How's your walk with God? Because if that doesn't exist or exist in a, you know, in a proper quantity, then everything else is going to be difficult. Because Jesus didn't call the 12 to work for him. He called the 12 to be with him. And out of that, out of that relationship flows ministry. Out of that relationship with him flows every other good thing. Amen. Someone said, my, my marriage is, is, is difficult. Having trouble with my marriage. Having trouble with my kids. My, my finances are a mess. Uh, my health is, is really off the rails. i got problems galore. Got a question for you. How's your walk with God? Yep. <laughs> Say, well, that, that doesn't matter. I'm having troubles over here. I think it connects to everything. Amen. I think it matters what we're able to receive in His promises. Because this thing is all... Um, the premise of everything else working is that we're in a union, a relationship with God, and that's not just a religious system. It's a daily interaction. That's right. When that goes away, and by the way, that's where the enemy's coming first. Right. <laughs> He's not first coming after your health or your finances or your relationship. He's first coming after this relationship. I don't mean he can steal your salvation, but he can turn this into, a, into religious bondage in a minute. The enemy comes to trip us up in that, to trick us, to get us out of a love relationship with God. Then he can come after the other aspects of your life. Then, then you're vulnerable to attack in other areas. When a person says, uh, you know, I really want to live a victorious Christian life. Understand, before you get to a victorious Christian life, you have to have a Christian life. And our definition of that is vital. Yeah. Say, well, I believe in the Lord. I, I, I believe in God. That's not what I said. The Christian life, as we defined it a couple weeks ago, the normal kind, it really centers around your, your walk with God. And if that is missing, yet I'm trying to get victory and unable to obtain it, I shouldn't look for victory principles. I should look for daily connection first. Amen. Out of that comes everything else. Amen. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. Okay. It's kind of like the person who, uh, you know, say we have a, an engaged couple um, wanting to be married. And they say, we want to have a Christian life together. We want a Christian marriage, 
a God-centered marriage. We want to have a Christian wedding and, and all this. But they don't do a Christian engagement. But they want to have Christian marriage. Everybody with me? If you want to have a Christian marriage and you're presently engaged and you're both believers, you might want to do that right first. Say, well, that's hard because then we can't have sex. <laughs> well, you want God in your marriage, but not in your engagement? Hallelujah. 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 I'm just saying, you understand what I'm saying. I don't even need to say what I'm saying. I think that principle moves across many areas. That the connection with God begins right here, right now, and it floods everything. Not we say this, but I'm going to do this later. You know, I'm going to tithe when I get my income up. Or when this credit card is paid off. Or when, no, no. I am who I am right here, right now, and I'm going to be the same person when I have more money. It's not about circumstances changing and then, no, I need to be who I am and live in a tight relationship with my father today, independent of everything else. Amen. Then let the victory flow out of that. Yes. Amen. Hallelujah. So I think being a real Christian is a life of walking with God, not just believing in God. You, you, uh, there's a popular scripture in Revelation chapter 3. In verse 20, it's the Lord Jesus talking to this church, church at uh, Laodicea. And he said to them, a uh, very strong statement. He said, uh, verse 20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. Okay? And sometimes we read that and we say, Isn't that wonderful? Jesus is knocking on the door of sinners' hearts. No, he's knocking on the door of Christians' hearts. Yeah. See, see, that was written not to the world, not to those who don't know him, but to those who do know him. And yet the description is kind of mind boggling. Lord, you're talking to your own people and you're, you're saying, open up, please. I want to spend time with you. I want to hang out with you. I want to have dinner together. The Lord being on the outside in this, figure, in this figurative language, the outside of the house for, of those who know him. Could it be possible that that's still true what happened in those people in that church could happen in our lives where the Lord is knocking. Not saying you're not saved, but if the Lord's knocking, he's not on the inside, but he wants to be. Yeah, he's just going to make me work. He's going to take my money. He's going to, he, what I read there is he just wants to come in and eat. In other words, hang out. The Lord, He just wants to come in and be with us. That's right. Yeah, that's what empowers everything else. That's where victory comes. That's where ministry comes. That's where every good thing that God wants to do, it's got to have that foundation or it turns into a mess. I don't want to become a Pharisee. I don't know about come you. No, come on. Right? Uh, praise God. That was to the lukewarm church. Lukewarm church, what's the Lord doing? Let me in. I want to come in. His desire is to be with us. Now, uh, there's an interesting passage, multiple, that define and describe our connection with the Lord. That's what we're talking about. All right? This default setting, this divine connection that believers have with God. And one of those is 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 15. And he likens our connection with him to what happens, what potentially could happen between a person and a, and a harlot, as it's used here. It's verse 15, which reads, Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? Certainly not. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a harlot is one body with her? For the two, he says, shall become one flesh. That's interesting because how many know one flesh? That's Genesis. That's marriage covenant language. When a husband and wife come together 
and they have their sexual union, they are said to be one flesh. He said, don't do that with your body with a, with a prostitute. He said, you don't, don't become one flesh with someone other than, than who you're married to. That's a big deal. And he said that, but then verse 17, but he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. So it's a comparison. It's, he said, just like you become one with someone physically through the sexual union, you become one with God in spirit through, you know, salvation, through faith in him, you become one with God. But that's now the description. If you're a believer Here's God's definition, description of your life with Him is you're one. You're one. One with God. This is a mentality that can be and ought to be ado adopted by all of us because that belief will produce experience. That belief will produce a mentality that is different from I'm here, God's there. He might be keeping me at arm's length because of how I've been thinking or how I've been talking. No, if you're in Christ, you have been made one spirit with him. That's worthy of pondering, I think. At times I like to do this. It's, I, you know, it's part of my prayer, but I like to just say things like, thank you, Lord, I'm one with you. You and me, we are one together. I've been connected to you. We think alike. We speak the same language. We live, we hear on the same frequency. We're made of the same substance. I am just like you. Yeah, and there's scriptures to back all that stuff up. But here's the problem is we want to have this amazing relationship with God, yet our mentality is we're so different. We're distant. We're disconnected. He's holy and I'm not. And so how can we ever get together? But by the blood of Jesus, we've been made holy. We've been made right. And some of this comes because, you know, often in church, we're hearing things like God's ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. But you know that scripture is talking about the wicked. Not talking about God's people. You read, you read, you look it up. It's in the Old Testament. You read it for yourself. You'll see that's the case. God doesn't define his own people as being opposite of him. He, he says we're like him. We're one with him. That's why I say by faith, Lord, we're the same. I'm like you. I think like you. Your ways, they're my ways. Amen. Amen. Now, in the middle of saying that, if you find yourself thinking or doing things that are contrary to God, you know he's not changing and you know, okay, that's obvious. I need to make an adjustment here. But spiritually speaking, we're one. The, to the same degree, say, what do you mean one? Well, I mean like Jesus and the Father are one. Because Jesus said that in John chapter 10 and verse 30, I and my Father are one. Same way he said, you are one with me in the Spirit. Praise the Lord. Would you turn with me to, to uh, John chapter 17? John, the 17th chapter. This is a powerful chapter. You might want to read the whole thing later. L look with me at John 17, verse 1. Then uh, Jesus spoke these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven, and said, Father, the hour has come, glorify your Son, that your Son also may glorify you. And as you have given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him, and this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Now, it's not uncommon for us to give description and definition to biblical words. And that's right. And you can look up actual meaning of words and languages and, and we'll do that here. Uh, but look at the Jesus dis definition, his description of eternal life. Notice he didn't say, this is eternal life. When you die, you go to heaven. This is eternal life. You get to miss the fire, right? 
No, those things are true, but he didn't define it as that. He defined it as something that is more, I don't know, root in nature. It's like heaven is, is the, the benefit, the result of it. But the foundation of this, eternal life, what does it mean? It means you know the Father. It means you know the Son. Yeah. Say, well, we can't really know Him until we get to heaven. Just the opposite. We can, and we are supposed to, know Him here and now. That's the foundation for everything else working. It really is. Now, this word, the, the word, I said we'd do a definition. The word know, K-N-O-W, that they may know you and they may know your son. Uh, the word know, the Greek word, is a word called ginosko or ginosko, however, I like hard G's better than soft ones. <laughs> Just like, you know, that road oh, down the street over here, it's, it's chinden, not shinden. Yeah. <laughs> right? Okay. Just so we're on the same page. <laughs> According to the word. <laughs> okay. Uh, Gnosko. This comes from uh, uh, Vine's uh, Dictionary of Words. Signifies to be taking in knowledge, to come to know, recognize, understand, or to understand completely. Frequently indicates a relation between the person knowing and the object known. So, so that's real important. We talk about knowing God, knowing the Father, knowing Jesus. We're talking about a relation, or we say relationship between. That, so I, I know God. What do you mean? I can give you his stats. No. It means I know him. What, what, what do you mean? There's a relationship here. In this respect, what is known is of value or importance to the one who knows, and hence the establishment of, of the relationship. How I many know we know a lot of things? We learn, we study various facts and truths, but you don't always have a relationship with them. You don't have a relationship, per se, with a math book, you know, or with an English, uh, you know book or assignment or something. No, you're learning facts. You're learning information. It's not that personal to you, not a relationship. Knowing God is different. Okay. Knowing God says he's important to me. He's valuable. We have a relationship. And the verb of this, of this word, gnosko, is also used to convey the thought of connection or union as between a man or woman, a man and woman. In other words, like Genesis, Adam knew Eve. You remember when Adam knew Eve, what happened? Baby. <laughs> Baby happened. So knowing Adam knew Eve wasn't, oh, Eve, your hair. <laughs> I mean, maybe it started there. I don't know. <laughs> or, you know, I, we have measured Eve, Eve. She's this tall, and I know her birthday, of course, and... Uh, uh, it wasn't just about those types of things. It was he knew her experientially. Okay, same language used in the New Testament. And uh, uh, knowing is used in that way. So if that type of word is used in our knowing God, this is eternal life that you know God. Now, it's not physical again. Obviously, we know that. But in the spirit, we were made one. So me knowing the Father and knowing his Son has to do with knowledge that is... I value him. Uh, I, I, my, I set my affection on the person, not just the information. I have experience with him. That's, that's, that's really one of the big differences. Lots of people have theology in their head. They have beliefs they hold to. They have statements of faith they adhere to. Less people have experiences with God where they can say, I have firsthand knowledge. I know him. I know the Lord. If I were to introduce my wife to you and tell you about her, you know, would you really feel like you knew her if I say, yeah, she's so tall and this is her age and this is where she lives. And I gave you all the stats, all the facts like that. Do you know her? No, you know a few things about her. And, and if that's, 
If that's our, the way that we know God, blah. Yeah. If you wanted to get her to know her more, I'd start telling you stories. I'd say, this is what she does. This is what she likes. This is what happened to us. Right? I'd be able to do that because we've uh, been in relationship for a long time. And if you wanted to know her even more, then you would talk to her personally. You'd become friends or something. You would know her. Think of walking with God the same way. Okay? Do we want to learn the stats? Yes, we do. I want to know facts. I want to have accurate theology. I want to study the book so I'm not wrong. But if that's where it ends, I'm missing the point. He never created us just to have perfect theology. Perfect information. It is about experiencing Him. If you were to tell someone else about the Lord, uh, tell someone else about God who didn't, didn't have a relationship with God, wasn't saved, um, how would you approach that? I mean, would you just give them the facts, give them the stats? I would probably do that in part, depending on what their questions were or what they believed. But I think it's better if, in addition to that, you tell them about what he's done for you. I think that's one of the most powerful ways to introduce someone to God, is he did this for me. My life was this way, and now it's this way. I had this problem. I prayed. He answered. I used to think this way. Oh, my life was a mess. And I learned his ways and his love. And this is what happened. This is the result. Isn't that better? Yes. Come on. The first you can argue with. The second, it's hard to argue with. But our relationship with God is not supposed to just be based upon information from a statistical or, uh, you know, that, that approach it is not merely intellectual, but also experiential. And the reason I say this, some of you say, yep, I know, oh, I, that's the way I live with him. And if you don't feel like you have that testimony of experiences with God, I'm here to announce. Dun, dun, dun. Good news. He wants to do that for you. If you'll seek him, knowing with an expectation of reward, if you'll seek him, he'll show himself to you, even after you're saved, more and more, increasing more and more. So you'll be able to say, I know him. I know him. And it's not just referring to, I memorized the verses. No, I know him. We're like together. We talk. We walk together. We do life together. I'm with the Lord. I love this. This is so good. And it's genuine. It's coming out, it's coming out of your heart. It's the way he wants it to be. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Look down. Let me just give you this in closing. At verse 20, uh, he went on to say, because he's praying through this chapter. Verse 20, I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. Who's that? Us. That's us. That they may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us that the world may believe that you sent me. And the glory which you gave me, I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one, I and them, you and me, that they may be perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. I want you to see what Jesus' prayer is. He's, he's defining eternal life. It's knowing the Father and the Son. And he's, saying, he's describing his own connection with the Father. They, the Father and the Son are one. It's a perfect union and relationship. Then he prays that you would have that too. And that I would have that too. Not me with you and you with me, but me with God and you with God. He's praying that that unity would be between you and the Father to the exact same degree that he had it. He says, let him know that you love them just as much as you love me. He said, what I have with you, they can have with you. And that's what makes it glorious. That's what makes this so desirable. You know, often we, we, we try to achieve unity amongst us by becoming like one another. And I adapt and you adapt and you compromise and I compromise. I'm a more like you, a little bit more like you. You're a little bit more like me. And it's all watered down from what, it's, what it could be. 
Because we achieve this, un this unity amongst each other, not by adapting to each other, but by spending time with the Father. If I'm like him and you're like him, you and me, we're tight. We agree. Right? It's the way to have a perfect marriage. If you're like him, and your spouse is like him, you're automatically going to agree, going to be on the same page, you're going to be flowing together. Yeah? That's why I think this issue that I'm calling how to walk with God solves a whole bunch of problems. It makes great families. It makes amazing churches. And Jesus said, and the world will be attracted to it. They will know about me because they see you have that same connection with the Father. It is so superior to a religion. It is so superior to just a disciplined life. You're connected to your Creator. You know Him. He knows you. You walk together. Enoch liked it so much, he kept on going. <laughs> Think I'm going to do another hundred years? I'm going to just keep, keep doing this. Walking by faith with God, this is so good. And one day he couldn't stand it. He thought, I'm going to do this another hundred years. And the Lord said, you can come on over if you want. He said, I'm done. <laughs> he, it was that desirable. So he did that. Wait, so it's going to be like, like church forever? <laughs> so it's going to be like an eternal prayer meeting? Uh, I don't know. Now this is where you separate what often people think about what God wants to do and the reality of the experience. If we had a perfect and clear picture of the reality of God and His presence and all that He is, not a one of us would say, give me a few more years here. And if we had the option, you know, not through death or something like that, but just had option, <laughs> we're out of here. <laughs> See ya. Wouldn't want to be ya. <laughs> I'm going because he is that good, that desirable. And I say it again. I say it again. God wants to reveal himself to you and me. He wants to show himself strong. He wants to reveal his ways, his glorious power. In his presence, the scripture said, is fullness of joy. And at his right hand are pleasures forevermore. He wants to give you and me not only more knowledge, we want that, information, but experience with Him. Amen. Praise God. Would you pray with me today? Maybe let's pray it together. Why don't you say this with me? Say, Father, Father I'm looking to you. Looking to you. I, earnestly I earnestly seek you. I diligently seek you, I diligently seek you. Knowing, that you are, knowing that you are and that you reward Show yourself to me. Reveal to me more of who you are, your ways, your wisdom, your love, and your power. I want to be with you more than I want to be with anyone on earth. I want what you have more than what this world has to offer. So I'm seeking you. Reveal yourself to me, I pray. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father, for what you're doing here.